Today is what we many times refer to as Palm Sunday. Um, it's also sometimes known as Passion Sunday because this next week is what is known um, as the Passion Week. We know more about Jesus' last week of his life than we do know about any other time of his life. And so Jesus, on this Sunday, almost 2,000 years ago, comes into Jerusalem on a donkey, on a colt. And it signifies um, a king, but not a king that is a conquering king, a king that comes in uh, with a peaceful reign. Had Jesus come in on a charger, on a horse, it would have uh, symbolized a conquering king coming into the city. But Jesus came in on a donkey, a colt, which signified a peaceful reign. And the uh, followers of Jesus lay down their coats, they lay down their palm branches, and they say, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the religious leaders will try to silence them. And Jesus will say, if they were to remain silent, the very rocks themselves would cry out. And Jesus will come into Jerusalem, and he will come and look at the temple area, and then he will leave. So he comes in, he raises Lazarus from the dead in, in Bethany, which is just outside of Jerusalem. You know, just a little suburb kind of of Jerusalem. And so he will come this week, he will come in the morning, he will come to the temple, he will preach he will teach at the temple and then in the evening he'll go back out to Bethany every single day he won't stay the night in Jerusalem and then on Thursday which we sometimes refer to as Monday Thursday would be the day that they celebrate normally would celebrate the Passover and so Jesus uh, has the disciples get an upper room and they gather together for the Passover. Typically, this is something that was done as a family unit. And the father or the grandfather, the patriarch of the family, um, would kind of be at the head table. And typically, a child would ask, why are we doing this? And then the patriarch of the family would then begin to explain the Passover and how God had passed over, the death angel had passed over them and God had delivered them from Egypt. It's during this meal that Jesus will break from tradition and institute the Lord's Supper. At that point, <clears throat> as soon as he has instituted the Lord's Supper, Judas will leave to betray Jesus. The disciples and Jesus will sing a hymn. They will get up. They will leave. They will go to the Mount of Olives where Jesus will pray. And he encourages the disciples to pray with them. So he will leave uh, the majority of his disciples. He will take James, Peter, and John a stone's throw away from where he is. And then he will begin to pray. And he will say, Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. However, not my will, but your will be done. And he will do this three separate times. And on the third time, he will get up and he will uh, go to the disciples and say, It's time. My betrayer is coming. And uh, the religious leaders and Judas and the guard will come and they will arrest Jesus where he will be taken to Caiaphas' house, the high priest's house, he will go through the mockery of a trial, an illegal trial. It was illegal in Israel, according to God's law, to try a person at night. And it was illegal to, to pass a death sentence without a 24-hour period of time for the Sanhedrin or the religious leaders to think about the seriousness of the charges and what they were doing. All of that will be bypassed. So Jesus will go through the mockery of a trial there. When the morning breaks on Friday morning, <clears throat> they will drag him uh, to Pilate and demand that he be crucified for his crimes. Pilate will find out that he's been up in Galilee and because Herod is nearby, probably in Jerusalem for the Passover, he will send Jesus to Herod. 
Herod hoping that Jesus will do a miracle when Jesus will not do a miracle. That's where they put the robe on him and the crown of thorns and they mock him and they beat him. Um, and then he will send him back to Pilate. Pilate will try to uh, get away to release Jesus. The religious leaders will have none of it. And um, so Pilate says, I'm, I'm going to scourge him and then I'm going to release him. And the religious leaders say, if you do this, you are no friend of Caesar. And so finally, Pilate will wash his hands and say, I find no fault in this man. Um, and then he will release him to be scourged and then crucified. Jesus receives not a, a Jewish beating of rods, which is a, a punishment that God had handed down, which was 40 lashes across the back with a rod. And they would always withhold one lash because if you miscounted, the person giving the uh, punishment would receive the same thing. So they would always give 39 Save one just in case they miscounted. This is not what this was. This was a Roman scourging. And there was no limit to the number of lashes. They would use a whip that was sometimes referred to as a cat of nine tails. Because on the end were nine separate uh, tassels. And embedded on the end of the tassels were glass or sharp beast pieces of metal. And they would stretch the back around a pole. And the uh, Roman soldier would just destroy the flesh on the person. And if he got tired, he might hand the whip to somebody else. And, and uh, Josephus was an early Christian writer and said that many people, many, many people died at the scourging post. And the fact that Jesus survived the scourging is a testament to his strength, his physical uh, strength. And then he is given probably the top beam of the cross and, and uh, instructed to carry it out to Calvary. And because of the scourging that he received, he's not able to carry the cross all the way. Simon of Cyrene will be pressed into service to carry the, the piece of the cross, the top brace of the cross, the remainder of the way. And on Friday, Jesus will be crucified in between two thieves. Because the, um, the Sabbath is coming, and it is also considered to be a high Sabbath, um, they don't want the bodies on the cross during the Sabbath. And so the Roman soldiers will come to break the legs of the people that are on the crosses. So with the anatomy of the human body and the way that they were placed on the cross, a person could breathe in, but in order to exhale, they would have to pull themselves up on the nails that were in their hands and on their feet in order to be able to exhale. So every single breath, they would have to pull themselves up painfully on those um, bindings that were holding them to that cross and so by breaking their legs, they couldn't do that and they would eventually asphyxiate. They would suffocate to death. By the time they come to Jesus, they see that he is already dead. And so they take a spear and they pierce his side. And uh, Luke, who was a physician, says that the water and the blood flowed. Uh, the blood is already separated. Jesus has already been dead for a little while. Um, he'll be taken down from the cross. He'll be laid in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. A stone is placed in front of it along with uh, Pilate's seal. Lest anybody try to break into there. And then Sunday morning, you know the rest. Jesus is raised from the dead, never to die again. And so those are some of the events that are coming this week that I want you just to think about and to reflect on as the days go by. You know, it's been several years ago, but um, when Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ came out, I went to go see that in the theater. And I was struck by the brutality and the savagery of Jesus' death. We read about it, we see pictures of it, but we don't see the reality of how horrible and awful a death it really, really was. 
And I understood why Jesus had to die. I knew that his death was necessary for my forgiveness. But why did his death have to be carried out in such a vicious and a brutal way? Even the sacrifices at the temple were never this cruel or painful. Why did Jesus have to have such a horrible death as it was? Well, this morning, I want to go back and I want to read the passage of Scripture that the video that we saw this morning uh, was referring to. It's Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 12. Now, I want you to understand this. Isaiah was written seven or nearly 700 years before Jesus was even born. So, uh, like 704 to 680, but uh, we're looking at Jesus' death about 33 AD, so easily 700 years before the event took place, Isaiah records this passage of Scripture. And I want you to see how closely it describes Jesus' death and his sacrifice. It says this, Who has believed our message? To whom will the Lord reveal his saving power? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, sprouting from a root in a dry and a sterile ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with bitterest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way when he went by. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God for his own sins. But he was wounded and crushed for our sins. He was beaten that we might have peace. He was whipped and we were healed. All of us have strayed away like sheep. We have left God's past to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the guilt and the sins of us all. He was opposed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. From prison and trial they led him away to his death. But who among the people realized that he was dying for their sins, that he was suffering their punishment? He had done no wrong. He had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and fill him with grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sins, he will have a multitude of children, many heirs. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of what he has experienced, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of one who is mighty and great. Because he exposed himself to death, he was counted among those who are sinners. He bore the sins of many and interceded for sinners." All of this was written 700 years before the events ever took place. Now, just to give you a little perspective on that, America as a nation, from the time that the Constitution was created in 1776 to today, is approximately... 248 years. So this was written nearly three times longer ago than America has been a nation. And yet, by the inspiration of God, Isaiah penned these words about Jesus' death and his crucifixion on the cross. 
This morning, I'd like to briefly share four reasons for Jesus' suffering that I found in my search. And perhaps they may help you understand God's reasons for Jesus' just brutal death that we see in Scripture. The first is this, so that we would understand how much God hates sin. Jesus suffered such a horrible death so that we would understand how much God hates sin. Isaiah 53, 10, the first part of that says, But the Lord's good plan, it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and to fill him with grief. I think part of the reason that Jesus had to suffer was so that we would understand how much God hates sin. We all know or have heard Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23 where it says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death but that the free gift of God is eternal life to all who will believe. But, and we realize that we're sinners and that the wages of our sin is death. But most of the time, we don't really see sin that way. We see sin as a minor infraction or a mistake. You know, like driving 60 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour speed zone. We know it's wrong, but everybody does it. And where's the harm? We tend to categorize sin like the Catholic Church does. The Catholic Church has venal sins, sins that aren't too bad, and then they have sins that are unto death, you know, the really bad ones, like, you know, killing or, <clears throat> you know, uh, adultery or, or other sins. The thing is that God doesn't see sin like that. All sin in God's eyes is insubordination to his will to his law, to his authority. You know, I've used this illustration before, but to me, it is the best one that brings this point across. If you tell your child to go clean their room, and they look you in the eye, and they say, I'm not going to do it, old man, and there's nothing that you can make me do to do it, suddenly we have a very different problem, right? Right? It's not just that the room is messy, it's the insubordination to dad's authority. And at that point, the Board of Education is going to find the seed of knowledge, right? Or something. When we sin, it's like we are shaking our fist at God and saying, I don't care what you say, I'm not going to do it. It's not just the sin, it is God's authority that is being challenged. It is God's law that is being broken. It is us saying, I'm not going to allow you to be the boss of me. I'm in charge of my own life. And so when God looks at sin, he sees sin very differently than we do. Because so many times we think about sin like we spilled milk at the table. I shouldn't have done that. Oops, my bad, right? But that's not the way God sees sin. God sees it as insubordination to him, as challenging God's authority. God hates sin. And Jesus suffered a cruel and an awful death because that's what we deserved and he wants us to realize just how bad evil and awful sin really is and so Jesus suffered a horrible death so that we could understand and realize just how bad sin really is <clears throat> a second reason that Jesus suffered such a brutal death is because Jesus would never ask us to do something that he himself would not do. Jesus would never ask us to do something that he himself would not do. 
In Matthew 16, 24, you'll notice that Jesus did not say, if you want to be my disciple, you must take up your cross and suffer for me. No, what Jesus said was, if you want to be my disciple, anyone, if anyone wants to come after me, he must be willing to deny himself, take up his cross, and do what? Follow me. Jesus isn't asking us to do something that he himself was unwilling to do. Jesus isn't standing behind the front line saying, okay, go get them, guys. Jesus is leading us and calling us to follow him. And so Jesus died this horrible, awful, terrible death. Because he's saying, you may have to die for me too. I'm not asking you to do anything that I was unwilling to do myself. <clears throat> you know, Jesus came to John the Baptist to be baptized. And in Matthew 3, 13 through 17, it says this. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. <clears throat> Jesus didn't have any sins that needed to be forgiven. So why was he baptized? Well, he said, to fulfill all righteousness. You see, Jesus isn't going to ask you to do something that he is unwilling to do himself. And so because Jesus asks us to be baptized, he himself was baptized. Not because he needed his sins forgiven, but because he was setting an example for us to follow. Jesus suffered on the cross because he, know, he knew and understood that we might have to suffer too. And so he led by example. Jesus said, follow me. This morning, down in Sunday school, we've been watching this series that's actually put out by the Louisville Christian Church. It's the biggest church in our brotherhood, uh, thousands of people every Sunday. Um, and it's called The Easter Experience on uh, Right Now Media. And, and I'd encourage you to watch it. It's like six sessions. They're about 30 minutes long each. And in this one, uh, this morning, we saw the betrayal of Judas and Jesus uh, denied by Peter three times. But um, in John, we see uh, John chapter, I uh, don't remember, very end, the very, very end of John, right? Uh, we see where Jesus deals with Peter. And it wasn't that Jesus couldn't forgive Peter. I think it was a situation where Peter couldn't forgive Peter, right? And so three times, just as Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus says to Peter, he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. And then Jesus says, feed my sheep. And after he gets done with that, he, he says to Peter, when you were young, you girded your own garments and you went where you want to go. But when you're old, someone else will gird you and they will stretch out your arms and they will take you someplace that you don't want to go. And he was sharing with Peter that Peter would die for his faith, for Jesus. And then he says this. Because Peter sees John behind him and he says, well, what about him, Lord? 
And he says to Peter, he says, you follow me. You follow me. Even though he told Peter that he would die for his faith, down the road, years to come, he said, follow me. Follow my example. You have to be willing to do what I did. The third thing, third reason that we can see that Jesus um, died such a horrible death on the cross was so that he could be a sympathetic high priest. Jesus suffered so that he could be a sympathetic high priest. In Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, it says this, Since we have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, who has um, gone into heaven, let us hold on to the faith that we have. For our high priest is able to understand our weaknesses. When he lived on earth, he was tempted in every way that we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then feel very sure that we can come before God's throne where there is grace. Therefore, we can receive mercy and grace to help us when we need it. In James, it says, when you are tempted, don't let anyone say, I'm being tempted by God. Because God doesn't tempt people, neither can he be tempted. God's not tempted by sin. But this passage in Hebrews says that Jesus was tempted in all ways, just like we were, yet was without sin. Something about the incarnation, something about taking on flesh and blood, allowed Jesus to experience what we are experiencing. And allows him to better understand our struggle. You know, Melanie and I, we, we have four kids. I love every one of them. They're great kids. And every single time that one of them prepared to come into this world, I was with Melanie in the delivery room. But I did not go through what Melanie went through. I, I could see she is in pain, and I tried to comfort her, but I don't, I cannot sympathize with her like some of you other ladies can, because I did not go through the same experience that she went through. Jesus understands our struggles. Because he went through the exact same thing that we struggle with. He went toe to toe with the devil in regards to temptation. And he did not he did not fail. And because of that, he understands us. He understands our struggle. And the Bible says there in Hebrews that he has become a sympathetic high priest. A high, a, the high priest was a person who brought people and God together. Right? And the high priest on the Day of Atonement would take the blood from the sacrifice And on that one day, and that day only, he would go into the temple, through the curtain, and into the Holy of Holies, and he would um, sacrifice, take the blood from that sacrifice, dip his finger in the bowl, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. That representation of God here on earth. The Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus didn't go into the temple, but rather he went into the real temple in heaven and offered his sacrifice before God himself. And because his sacrifice was acceptable, he was raised to life on the third day. If Jesus had sinned, if there had been anything that would have disqualified him as the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice for men's sins, we wouldn't be celebrating Easter next week because Jesus would still be in the grave. 
we'd still be taking our bulls and our lambs and our goats to sacrifice in Jerusalem. But he died a horrible death so that he could understand our weaknesses. And then finally, he suffered because it was the only way that God could forgive our sins. It was the only way that God could forgive our sins. <clears throat> Isaiah 53, 8-11 says this, From prison and trial they led him away to his death. But who among the people realized that he was dying for their sins? That he was suffering their punishment? He had done no wrong. He had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave, but it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and fill him with grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have a multitude of children, many heirs. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of what he has experienced, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. For he will bear all their sins. The heirs that Isaiah was talking about were not physical children it's you and i we are the heirs of jesus that isaiah is referring to <clears throat> many times i don't think that we really understand god all that well if you really want to understand god you have to realize that he can never 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 did i say never never be untrue to himself. He has to be true to himself or he would not be God. That means that God has to meet his love, his attribute of love. He has to meet his attribute of justice. And he can't just ignore his justice and embrace his love. <clears throat> There's for all of us, there have been times when our kids did stuff that was wrong, but we were just so cute, you know, you just, you just had a hard time, right? Um, somebody that I know when they were very, very little knew that they were going to get a spanking. And so they went upstairs and they put on every single pair of panties that they had, like every one, right, before they came down to meet dad, and when dad saw them, you know, he had the hardest time to keep from laughing. But he still gave his little girl a spanking, right? And that little girl said it didn't feel like there was any panties on it. It <laughs> still didn't matter, right? Dad's big hand. Um, God can't ignore his, his justice to embrace his love. And the only way that God could be true to himself was for somebody who is not guilty to pay the price for those who were. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Isaiah says, so that God crushed him so that our sins could be forgiven. You know what? There's, there's a part of us that knows it here but has a hard time knowing it here. We know that Jesus died for our sins at great cost. We know that here. But sometimes there's a disconnect between our head and our heart. And we don't really realize just how much it costs God. To watch his son die on the cross. Have you ever. Have you ever heard someone say something unkind maybe about your child. And man you just want to let them have it. Right. I mean you just want to smack that smug smile right off their face. Imagine what it was like for God. As he watched Jesus being mocked and crucified 
and ridiculed. I do not know how he kept from just wiping the top of Calvary clean. <laughs> because that's certainly what I'd have done. I'd have ushered all of those people straight into eternity. But because he loved you, he watched his son die on the cross so that you could spend eternity with him. Don't lose sight of that this week as we celebrate the Passion Week.